I'll look it up sometime, and uh, that's a good one. Take your Bible this morning. I'm going to read the scripture Brother Booth is going to be using this morning. Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 for our scripture reading, and appreciate Brother Booth coming and being here with us this week, and uh, he's been up in northern part of Ohio uh, last week and earlier in the week, and then he'll be with us this week, and then he'll get to finally go home, I think, on Saturday, and um, appreciate his friendship through the years, his faithfulness to the Lord, and uh, he's uh, someone that we've always enjoyed having here at Bible Baptist Church, and looking forward to what the Lord's going to do with him this week. Uh, in our midst and uh, appreciate you being here appreciate brother booth and his friendship and his fellowship and uh, we're praying for god to do great things in the next several days we have together all right as our custom is let's stand together to read the scripture all of us standing please luke 19 i'm going to begin together on verse one you join me on verse two we'll alternate <clears throat> reading the verses till we end together on verse number 10 and jesus entered and passed through jericho and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him. And said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, we ask you to add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the word of God, and thank you that we hold copies of it in our hand this morning. And I, Lord, we're asking you now that you will prepare our hearts, that our hearts would be good soil, that the word of God would fall into and bring forth fruit in our lives. That, Lord, you'll be with Brother Booth as he brings us the message today, and Lord, use him as your vessel to communicate your truth to each of our hearts. May you have our way in each one of our lives is our prayer. Yes. Blessed is special now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Like a blind man I wandered, so lost and undone. A beggar so helpless, without God or his son. Then my Savior in mercy heard and answered my cry. And oh, what a difference since Jesus passed by since jesus passed by since jesus passed by oh what a difference since jesus passed by well i can't explain it and i cannot tell you why but oh what a difference since jesus Pass by. All my yesterdays are buried in the deepest of the sea. That old load of guilt I carried is all God. Praise God, I'm free. Looking for that bright tomorrow where no tears will dim the eye. Well, oh, what a difference! Since Jesus passed by, since Jesus. 
Jesus passed by, since Jesus passed by, oh, what a difference since Jesus passed by. Well, I can't explain it, and I cannot tell you why, but oh, what a difference since Jesus passed by. You want to sing that chorus with me? Since Jesus passed by, since Jesus passed by, oh, what a difference since Jesus passed by. Well, I can't explain it, and I cannot tell you why, but oh, what a difference since Jesus has by Well, I have thoroughly enjoyed the music this morning, and uh, that blesses my heart. I've just really counted an honor and privilege to be here again. Uh, I love uh, your pastor and his family, and I pray for him every day, every morning. He's on my prayer list, and and uh, it's just a joy to be here once again. Looking forward to the next few days together. And uh, man, I appreciate the song, Brother Bob. It just so uh, fits in with the message as often the Lord works that out. And, and uh, so, boy, it's just, just good. And I could tell that the pastor has really been working with you, Brother Bob, on that singing. You're doing well. <laughs> Amen. And praise the Lord for that. Uh, so just... Just looking forward to the entire week together. I was in uh, Toledo last week and then spent a couple of days in Mansfield, Ohio. And uh, I, I was really thinking about starting off the revival uh, wearing my Michigan Wolverine uh, sweatshirt. Uh, but pastor said it would affect my love offering, so I, I didn't <laughs> feel led to do that. Uh, I was getting ready to preach Friday evening just about 30 minutes before I preached the pastor in Mansfield texted me a picture of uh, Urban Meyer holding the crystal football, you know, championship uh, trophy, and next to him was Jim Harbaugh with his shirt off just holding the football. And uh, I said, man, just ruined the whole spirit. I struggled even preaching after that, but uh, I'm looking forward to the week together. I want to really encourage you, invite folks to come out. You never know. Sometimes folks will come out in a special meeting. They won't come out any other time. And uh, you never know what the Word of God will do in somebody's heart if they'll just uh, be in, in the service and let the Holy Spirit work in their lives. And so invite folks to come out. And, and especially I want to encourage you to be back tonight. Please be back for the service tonight. I just feel like it's really a crucial message, uh, the time in which we're living I think it may answer some questions for some people, and I just really want you to be here. Uh, my wife really worked hard on that message, and, and I want to preach it tonight. And just, just kidding with you. But uh, I do want you to be here tonight. I, I really uh, think it would. If you choose to miss any night, please don't miss tonight. And uh, so I hope that you'll be here. Well, Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. We read here the story about the salvation, salvation of Zacchaeus. And uh, many of us growing up in church sung that little Sunday school song. How many have sung that? All right, and Zacchaeus was that wee little man. And, uh, and here's the story, the account of Zacchaeus' salvation. Now, we don't know a whole lot in the Word of God about Zacchaeus. Uh, but we do know a few things that are mentioned here about this man Zacchaeus. And it tells us that Zacchaeus was Jewish, that is, he was a son of Abraham, so we know he was a Jewish man. It tells us that Zacchaeus was small of stature, and, uh, and we know that. And uh, we, we know that Zacchaeus was a publican. Now, let's not talk about publicans and Democrats, all right? A publican in the New Testament was, was a tax collector. 
and, uh, and he was given the assignment to go and collect taxes from the, the citizens there. He worked for the Roman government. Now, tax collectors were known to add exorbitant fees on top of the Roman government requirements so they could pad their own pocket. So they were not popular people. Sounds a little familiar, doesn't it, in our society? And Zacchaeus was a publican. He was a tax collector. But the Bible tells us beyond that he was a chief publican. And, and, and the way it was set up in those days was kind of like a franchise. There would be an area divided and a chief publican would be over a region. He would often hire other publicans to help uh, with the job of collecting taxes. For example, Matthew in the New Testament was a publican as well. He was a tax collector. But Zacchaeus was a chief publican. And the Bible makes a statement here that's, that's very noteworthy. It makes sure that it adds on when it tells us about Zacchaeus that he was rich. He was rich. God wanted us to know that. That's why it's in the Bible. He was rich. And I'm wondering myself, the Bible tells us that when, when Jesus was passing through Jericho, that Zacchaeus, there was always a great crowd pressing on the Lord. Zacchaeus being short of stature, he wanted to see him. And so he ran ahead, it says, he ran ahead of the crowd. He climbed up this dirty old sycamore tree just to see this one called Jesus. And I wondered to myself, what would cause a man who was rich I mean, no doubt everybody in, in the area knew Zacchaeus. No doubt everybody knew where his mansion was. No doubt that, that Zacchaeus wore the nicest of clothing. I'm sure he drove the nicest of chariots made by Mercedes. you, you got to study to get some of those things. But he was rich. What would cause a rich man like that to lay aside his dignity to run ahead and climb up a dirty old sycamore tree just to see this man Jesus. Well, I'm sure a part of it was curiosity. I'm sure that Zacchaeus had heard people talking. I'm sure he'd heard about, about Matthew, that publican, who in the, the middle of the day left the receipt of customs, his job, just to follow this man Jesus. I'm sure that Zacchaeus had heard about that blind man that sat on the corner for years begging for just enough to sustain life. But when Jesus came through and Jesus touched him, his, his blind, blindness left and he was able to see. I'm sure that Zacchaeus had heard about that woman with an issue of blood for 12 years that had been to every doctor and spent all of her substance and nobody could help her. But when she reached out and touched the hem of Jesus' garment, she was made whole. I'm sure that Zacchaeus heard about that crazy maniac that was full of devils running around the tombs of Gadara without his clothes on. They couldn't chain him, and, and they, would, they would use, a, uh, he would take sharp rocks, and he would cut himself and bleed. And I'm sure that, that, that Zacchaeus heard about when Jesus came and found that demon-possessed man in Gadara, and he yielded himself to the Lord Jesus Christ and ended up sitting and clothed and in his right mind. I'm sure that Zacchaeus had heard about Lazarus, who had died and was in the tomb for four days. And when Jesus came, he said, Roll that stone back. And they said, But Lord, he stinketh by now. He's been in there four days. And the Lord said, Roll the stone back. And when they did, he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came back to life. I'm sure that Zacchaeus was curious. He had heard those stories about Jesus. But I want to tell you something, folks. I'm convinced with all of my heart it was much more than curiosity. For the Bible specifically wanted us to notice he was rich. He was rich. I mean, he, he had everything that everybody in this world thinks is going to bring them satisfaction. But his life was empty. And he ran to climb up that tree because there was something in the soul of Zacchaeus that was unfulfilled. 
You see, God made us different than he made any other creature he made. When God made man, he breathed into him the breath of life, and he became a living soul. He didn't do that for any other creature that he made because God wanted a specific personal relationship with this creation called man. And folks, I'm going to tell you, there is nothing in the whole world that will bring satisfaction, lasting fulfillment in your soul until you have that right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing else will work. We got the whole world clamoring after finding some fulfillment. They're getting drunk and they're getting high and they're trying different immorality and perversions, all looking for that. That's something that will keep them happy. That's something that will fulfill. And I'm telling you, there's nothing in this world that can fulfill that empty void because God made us with a soul, a capacity to know him. Until that's filled with the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot have real fulfillment in life. And here was Zacchaeus, rich but empty. Years ago when I was pastoring in, in Michigan and, and uh, I, I felt like God was calling me to evangelism and so uh, I surrendered to go into evangelism. I resigned the church I was pastoring. Somebody, I wanted my family to travel with me and somebody told me about a, uh, a man that had a, an RV dealership in Richmond, Indiana named Tom Rayford. And they said, Tom loves the Lord, and man, he's got huge RV dealership. In fact, it was the largest RV dealership in North America. And he said, the guy loves the Lord, and he won't give you an RV, but he will certainly make you the best deal you can get. And so I went down, I met Tom, and man, we just bonded. Just a guy that loves the Lord, he's a soul winner, and man, we just had a great time. And, and so he showed me what could be done, and we ordered a fifth-wheel travel trailer that would be our home as, uh, as we would travel as a family. My kids, four kids, were, were young at that time. And, and, and so we ordered a fifth-wheel travel trailer. And I, I remember when, when uh, uh, Tom called me and said, you know, on this Saturday, the fifth wheel will be ready to be picked up. And so we were excited, and we traveled over to, to Richmond, Indiana to, to get that RV. We are all excited to be, be our new home as we traveled on the road. And... And uh, it was a blizzard condition that day. Snowing, ice, blowing. I mean, it was horrible. And, uh, and we get there that morning, and Tom said, now, it, it should be ready by this afternoon for you to get moved in. And he said, but, but Brother Tim, he said, you know, I would prefer that you, uh, if you don't have a place to preach Sunday, if you just stay over for the weekend. He said, you know, we've got RV hookups right here at the, at the dealership and it won't cost you anything and, and you can go to church with Suzanne and I and, and, uh, and, and you know, I, just real unsafe driving and, and uh, I didn't have anything scheduled that Sunday so I was thankful because I had never pulled a fifth wheel b before in my life. Some of evangelism is faith and a little foolishness. <laughs> and so... We were excited that afternoon, you know, I mean, here's, Tom's got this, this huge RV dealership, 80 acres, side-by-side -side RVs, owed a dime to nobody. He was rich. And, and I remember he said to me that afternoon, now he said, um, Tim, he said, we close, and I think it was 5 o'clock, he said, now, now after we close, he said, nobody's going to be here until Monday. He said, so if, if you need anything, here's my personal phone number. And I'm thinking to myself, I wouldn't call him for anything. I mean, this, this guy's rich. He loves the Lord. I'm sure there's been a lot of people take advantage of his kindness. I'm not going to call this guy and bother him for anything. And so we, we were excited. We got the opportunity. We're, we're moving our stuff into the fifth wheel. We're unloading our... Our, our raggedy old luggage and everything, you know, and man, we're excited. This is our new home, and, and uh, I'm not the most mechanically inclined person, and I could not get the heat to work. And I'm looking through the manual, you know, and I'm trying to figure this out, and, and I'm begging God to help me to interpret the tones that were in that manual, and I'm thinking to myself, I am not calling Tom Raper. I'm not going to bother him. I'll get this thing figured out. 
It's getting on into the evening. The wife and kids were huddled together. It was getting cold. And I was determined, I'm not calling Tom Rayford. But I am married. <laughs> so I called Tom Rayford. I said, Brother Tom, man, I hate to bother you. I said, I am sorry, but I, I, I cannot get the heat working. He said, don't worry about it, Brother Tim. He said, just pack up the wife and kids and come on over to our house for the weekend. You could just stay with us and... And, uh, you know, nobody's going to be back in until Monday, and you can go to church with us. We'd love to have you. I said, Tom, I'm not going to do that. I said, no, that's not what I'm calling for. I said, if you just give me directions to a, a reasonable motel in the area, we'll, we'll go get a room. And he said, no. He said, Suzanne and I have never been able to have children. We love kids, so just come on over. And I said, Tom, you don't understand. A wife and four kids takes an act of Congress to get ready for church in the morning. <laughs> and... He said, well, Tim, he said, we've got five extra bedrooms and five extra bathrooms. You think that's enough? <laughs> I said, probably so. <laughs> he said, we'll be offended if you don't come. I said, oh, man, okay. So we put everything back in our raggedy old suitcases and got back in the, the truck, and we followed directions over to Tom's house, and beautiful, beautiful, beautiful neighborhood with these big huge lots and estates you know and we drive down this long driveway to the back of the house where Tom directed us and he was out there waiting on us and I pulled in and we're getting out and got our old raggedy suitcases and my wife and my four kids look like the Beverly Hillbillies of fundamentalism <laughs> <laughs> we're walking into this mansion of a place and when we walked in, there were these beautiful figurines everywhere. And my wife's eyes are big, and the kids are looking, and, and Tom said, oh, yeah, Suzanne, she loves we to go to auctions and, and, and buy these. She, he said, that one there is about 25000 I looked at my kids. <laughs> Life will be over as you've known it. Tom said to me, oh, brother, but don't worry about the kids. If they break something, we'll buy another one. <laughs> now, I want to tell you something. He was rich. And I'll never forget before I left town on Monday. He said, Tim, would you come in my office for a few minutes? I said, sure. We sat down, and he said, I want to ask you if you'd do something for me. And I said, Tom, if there's anything I could do for you, I'd be glad to do it for you. He said, I want to ask you to do this. He said, you see, I know us independent Baptists, we go soul winning, you know, we'll, we'll go into the lower income areas. And he said, I understand, you know, a lot of times they're more open to talk and answer the door and that kind of thing. But he said, would you, would you just once in a while go into those rich neighborhoods? He said, you see, those are my people, my family, my friends. He said, I want to tell you something, Brother Booth. They are as messed up in their lives, on drugs, alcoholics, get divorced, into perversion. They're as messed up as anybody you'll find in the lower income areas. You see, all of that the old world makes look so important cannot fulfill that empty void that God made. For us to have a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. When I was pastoring in Louisiana, my oldest son, he was managing a fitness gym. That's where I start, started my bodybuilding career. And <laughs> my oldest son called me one day. He said, Dad, he said, um, there's been a guy working out in the gym here. He said he, he, uh, he came from New York City and he came to help Evangel High School with their football program. And and they've got a big football program in Louisiana. And, and he, said, um, he, he said, but he's not happy with the church there. He, 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 he just, they don't seem to have convictions like what he was taught when he got saved. And, and I told him, well, you need to come hear my dad preach. And, and he said, I think he's going to come Sunday. He used to play NFL football. And I said, really? I said, now, was he on, just on a team or did he really play? He said, no, he played. 
That's what he said. And I said, well, did you get his name? He said, yeah, his name's Mark Gastineau. I said, well, yeah, I know the name Mark Gastineau. He's a Hall of Famer. Man, he, he held the most sacks in a season record as a defensive end for the New York Jets. And I said, I know who that is. And uh, he said, well, he, he said he may come Sunday. I said, excited, you know, so you never know if they're going to show up or not. Sunday morning I get up, and there's Mark Gastineau sitting right there. He stood up as a visitor, said, my name's Mark Gastineau from New York City. I'm looking around at the response of the people to see how many people recognize who he was. Nobody did. <laughs> but I knew who he was. And, uh, and man, he, he came for about six weeks, and then he moved back to New York City. But, but uh, he'd gotten saved after his NFL career. And, uh, man, he's just a tender-hearted guy and really a delight to talk with. And, but he told my son this. He said, Tim, when I was playing in the NFL, he said, I wasn't saved. And he said, you know, I had the big name. He said, I, I, I had reached that fame. He said, I made the big money. He said, I had the big fancy house. I had the fancy cars. I had all the vice that I could, could, could want available to me. He said, Tim, I made so much money. He said that one time I cast a, 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 a bonus check. And I stuck it in, in, a, in a briefcase, and it was over six figures. And he said, I stuck it in a briefcase. He said, I was going, had to hurry up and get to the, to the plane and, and go to another game. And I, he said, I got on the plane, and he said, I stuck it in the overhead, you know. And he said, when I got off the plane, I wasn't even thinking about it. He said, I had so much money, I wasn't even thinking about it. I walked off and forgot it. Now, every time I get on an airplane, I'm looking in the overhead. <laughs> He said, but Tim, he said, I want to tell you something. All of the fame and all of the money I had, the big house and the cars and all of that. He said, I go home at night and nobody knows the big macho man, Mark Gaston, old big tough NFL player, would go home at night and crawl in his bed and I would weep until I fell asleep because my life meant nothing. And the old devil gets you all worked up, man. I got to get that new house. I got to have this. I want to tell you, none of that stuff satisfies if you don't have the right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Zacchaeus was rich, but his life was empty. I want you to notice something else in the story here. I want you to notice it tells us in verse 10 the whole reason why Jesus told the story about Zacchaeus. It says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. You see, it tells us that Jesus wasn't just passing through that day. He wasn't just on a leisurely walk that day. But he was walking through Jericho because he knew that there was a Zacchaeus that needed him. He knew that Zacchaeus would be up that tree. And so when he came by, he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, can you imagine the shock that must have come to Zacchaeus? I mean, he ran over there to, to see who Jesus was, and Jesus knew him by name, knew where he was. Zacchaeus, come down. Must have been a shock to Mrs. Zacchaeus when Zacchaeus brought the Son of God home for dinner. But I want you to see that we have a Savior that cares and he knows where you're at, and he knows your name, and he knows your burdens, and he knows what's, what's hurting, and he knows all those things about you. He knows your address, and he knows where you're at this morning. And you're not here by mistake. And we have a Savior that cares about our condition and where we are. Folks, I don't know who's saved and who's lost this morning here. I don't know who's got a right relationship with the Lord and who doesn't have a right relationship. But he does. He walks down the corridors of every single heart. He knows your condition. He knows if you're battling with a sin habit. He knows if you if you got a struggle trusting him. He knows all these things. He knows if you're saved or you're lost. And his great desire is to bring folks back to a relationship with the Heavenly Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. He come to seek and to save that which was lost. It's amazing that when Adam 
sinned against the Lord in the Garden of Eden, you know that next day it wasn't Adam that started looking for God. It was God that came and said, Adam, where art thou? You know, he tells us three different stories in Luke chapter 15. He tells us about that lost sheep. You know, that, that shepherd had 90 and 9 that he left behind to go seek after that one lost. And when he found him, he brought him on his shoulders. When he came back, there was great rejoicing. And then he tells us about that woman that swept through the whole house and found that one lost coin. When she found it, there was great rejoicing. And he tells us about that lost son, that prodigal son, that when the father saw he was coming down the road, he ran and, and threw his arms around him and hugged him and kissed him. And, and he called back and said, Hey, kill the fatted calf, get a robe and put it on him and shoes to put on his feet, a ring to put on his, his finger. My son was lost, but he's found. He was dead, but he's alive. And I'm going to tell you, each of those illustrations... It says that they decided to have a party for that lost son. You know why? Because the, the, our God's heart and desire is that lost men come to Christ. And it brings the greatest joy. Are you saved this morning? Can you look at that time when you knew that you were a sinner on your way to hell and the Spirit of God was convicting you? And somebody loved you enough to take the Bible and show you that if you'd come with a repentant heart and ask the Lord to save you, that He'd save you. You see, it doesn't say if you come to church that you get to heaven. It doesn't say if you go through baptismal waters or classes of confirmation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And here we see in the story that our Lord knew where Zacchaeus was. He went looking for him. He knew where Paul was on the Damascus Road that day, didn't he? He knew where that maniac was in Gadara. He knew where Zacchaeus was. The young preacher got up to preach. Just as he started his message, he saw in the back, the doors opened up and an older gentleman walked in. He stopped in the introduction of his message. He said, folks, a dear friend just walked in the door and I'd like him to come up to the pulpit and just greet you and just say a few words that are on your heart, and then I'll continue the message. And the older man came up, and he said, well, he said, I'll just tell you a real quick story, and I'll sit down. He begins to tell this story. There was a couple of teenage boys sitting in the front row. Boy, they listened real intently. The older man said, years ago, there was a, a father that took his son out fishing. And his son had asked to take a neighbor boy. The father and his son, they went to church faithfully together. They had trusted Christ as their Savior. And, but he knew that the neighbor boy was not saved. They were out fishing together, and all of a sudden a storm hit very, very quickly. The waves were so huge that they flipped the boat over. And he's telling the story. He said that father reached over and grabbed onto the boat and hung on to stay afloat, but he noticed the two boys were pulled away by the current and the waves, and they began to drift apart and were going under the waves. And he realized he had a life preserver, but he only had one. And he thought to himself very quickly, boy, if, if, if my son drowns, I will see him again in heaven one day. But if my son's friend drowns, he's going to go to hell for eternity. He had to make a quick decision. And the old fellow telling the story, these boys were paying close attention and he said suddenly that father grabbed that life preserver and he threw it to the neighbor boy and watched his own son go under the waves and drown. Then he said, I tell you that story to say this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And he went and sat down. Preacher preached his message after the invitation. He's standing in the back with that older gentleman. People are coming out shaking hands. Then these two boys came out. They shook their pastor's hand. Then they said to the older gentleman, they said, you know, sir, that was a real interesting story you told. Just not very realistic. He said, why do you say that? He said, you know, no dad's really going to throw a life preserver to a lost kid hoping one day he might get saved and watch his own son drown. And that older man said, well, boys, 
It's not only realistic, it's true. He said, you see, I was that dad and your pastor was that boy. And I'll just tell you that to say this. We don't comprehend how much our God loves us. He gave his own son that we could be saved. And you see in this story there's a Savior that cares. And you may be lost this morning. The old devil may have you chasing after things that aren't going to fulfill. But I want to tell you the best news in the world. You can be forgiven. You can trust Jesus this morning. You can have eternal life. You can know that your sins are washed in the blood of Christ. And one day to spend eternity with him. You've got to make the choice. Nobody can do that for you. But it's the best choice you'll ever make in your life. I want you to also see. His reception was joyful. Because nobody receives the Lord sorrowfully. It's a great joy to be saved. The old devil makes it. Well you give your heart to the Lord you know. And then you're going you're gonna to have to miss out on all this you know what you're going to miss out on? A bunch of empty roads. A bunch of misery in life. There's nothing there that's going to bring you fulfillment and joy. There's nothing in this world that can promise you a peace that passeth all understanding. In the midst of your heartaches and burdens, there's nothing in this world that can promise you a joy-filled life. But my Savior can give that. He received him joyfully. So nobody ever receives him sorrowfully. But you know, I wish we'd have a revival in independent Baptist churches of the joy of the Lord. Man, folks, if we're saved, we got so much to be thankful for. We got so much to rejoice about. To think that He, in, in, in His sovereign wisdom and, and heart of love and mercy, would send His Son to save somebody like me? Man, we've got so much to be thankful for. Yeah, but Brother Booth, I'm going through this trial. That's all right. I can show you where he'll go through it with you. You don't have to go through it by yourself. That's a problem. A bunch of us are going through the struggles of life, and we're trying to handle it on our own. You can handle it on your own. But i got a Savior that will walk through every storm with you, and he promises he's got grace sufficient if you'll receive it. Man, we need a revival of the joy of the Lord. We ought to have a bunch of folks start this revival meeting out and come to the altar and say, Dear God, forgive me for being a whining, griping, complaining Christian. Man, it's the worst advertisement to this old world that needs Christ to see a bunch of folks at work that claim to be saved and they're walking around like the world is just about to end and they've lost their best friend. I want to tell you, I'm never going to lose my best friend. Because he said he won't leave me nor forsake me. No matter what, what else is going on. You know that everything that God's ever done was good? Right. Read the book of Genesis when he, when he created everything he created. At the end of it he said and it was good. Because I'm telling you everything my God does is good. Doesn't mean there's not pain. Doesn't mean there's not weeping. Doesn't mean there's not heartaches at times. But that's that peace that passeth understanding. Which wouldn't make sense to the world, but to the Christian, we know that even in the heartache, God can give you that peace. We need to have a revival of the joy of the Lord. Who wants to be attracted to your Savior when they see you moping at home? Oh, boy, yeah, life's rough. And it's, you know. Man, they already got that. My dad used to say, We got a bunch of a Baptists walking around, their faces hanging down so long they could eat corn on the cob through a picket fence. <laughs> And that's about the truth of it. What a sorry testimony for a great loving God. He received him joyfully. Let me finish up. Then I want you to see in verse 8 something amazing. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him four, fourfold. What? Is that Zacchaeus? He was the guy that didn't, didn't bother his conscience to rip off people and add fee on fee so he could get rich? And now, what a change. And I want to tell you something. When you trust Jesus and give him your heart, there's an evident change that takes place. Doesn't mean you're super Christian overnight. 
doesn't mean you can push a spiritual microwave button in your Billy Sunday the next morning. There's growth in grace. I understand that. But I want to tell you, when you get saved, the Bible promises the Holy Spirit of God comes to dwell within you. And that Holy Spirit won't dwell within you and let you continue on in the same life pattern of wickedness without making you mighty miserable. It's a change. There's new desires that come. Got a new destination. I'm asking, does anybody see a change in you? You claim to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus walked this earth among sinners, the most wicked of the wicked, and yet it never affected his holiness. He walked among the most hateful of the haters, but it never affected his love. Do you think you can really have a relationship with him and not be changed. He's almighty God. When you begin a relationship with him. There is a change that takes place. Doesn't mean you conquer everything immediately. No we're still growing in the Lord. And my wife reminds me. I still got things to conquer. Amen. But there is a desire. And there is. I could look back and say. Thank God look how far he's brought me. I have a dear friend that. Grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Full-blooded Cajun. Cajun people aren't normal people. <laughs> and and I, I mean, old James, his shoulders are about like this, you know. Just big old guy. The strongest man I've ever met with just normal brute strength. And uh, I mean, James grew up rough. And uh, he didn't grow up in a Christian home. And uh, James, he, he's got three brothers. I was over at his house one time visiting his mother uh, with him, a little, little single-wide trailer, you know. She said to James, she said, James, I, I'm upset with your brother George. He said, Mama, what's, what's wrong? Why are you upset with George? Well, I've told him a million times, if he keeps lifting those engines out of those cars with his bare hands, he's going to hurt his back one day. He won't listen to me. I mean, James didn't bat an eye. He said, I'll talk to him, Mama. <laughs> They're not normal people. I'm telling you. My oldest son, when he was working out real heavy with weights, he bench pressed 565 pounds, and that's a lot of weight. Well, James has known my boys since they were little guys, and so James sat down with him one day. He said, Tim, you think you're ready now? And he put his arm up to arm wrestle him. Tim said, okay. So they locked up. People standing around. And, and he says, all right, Tim, go. My son went, oh. And James is talking to people like this. And then all of a sudden he said, you're about where my sister is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just telling you, unusual. But when James was uh, growing up, his daddy had been afflicted with polio as a little boy. And so his dad was short of stature. He walked with a limp. And James said, so kids made fun of my dad, you know. Kids could be cruel. He said, so I just grew up whipping somebody every day. So they're just fighting all the time. He said, it never bothered me, Brother Booth. It didn't bother my conscience, no matter how bad I hurt him. But he said, one day I was just a young teenager, and I got into it with a man on the street. He said, I knocked him out. I jumped on, on him. He said, I was smashing his head into the pavement. Blood's going everywhere. He said, two little boys standing there said, Mister, you going to kill that man? He said, it was like the first time God woke up my conscience. And he said, man, I better, I better stop. He got off of him. Just a, within a few weeks, somebody witnessed to James. And James got saved. He said, man, when the Lord saved me, everything changed. And he started going witnessing to everybody. Well, he had a reputation. I mean, everybody at school, he played football, big-time football player, and everybody knew James. He didn't mess with him. And he was, he was witnessing to a boy at school. And that boy spit in his face. And James stopped. Everybody backed up. He just turned around. He went to the parking lot, rode over to his pastor's office. He walked up to his pastor's office. Pastor said, open the door and come in. He opened the door. 
His new pastor said to him, James, what are you doing out of school? He said, preacher, I need you to help me. He said, I, I, I need to ask you something. He said, you know, I've been witnessing to everybody. He said, oh, I know, James, everybody talking about it. He said, well, I witnessed to a boy at school and he spit in my face. He said, normally, preacher, I'd have beat the dog out of him by now. He said, but I need to know what to do as a Christian. His pastor said to him, James, that boy needs Jesus just like you needed Jesus. He said, okay. So he turned around and he left. That weekend, it was known among the young people that there was going to be a party at this parent was going to be out of town and this guy was going to have a party at the house. James knew the boy would be there, so the party was blaring, the music was going, and James walked up and they peeked out the blinds. They saw it was James. They turned the music off. It was dead quiet. They opened the door a little bit. James pushed the door open the rest of the way. What do you want, James? He just walked in. He walked over. That boy was sitting on the couch. And he pulled a Bible out from behind his back. And he said, I want you to know something. Jesus saved me. He's changed my heart. He said, I want you to know I love you. And I want you to go to heaven with me someday. I went out and bought you a new Bible. And it handed him a Bible. And he turned around and walked out. Two weeks passed. He got a phone call. It was his pastor. He said, uh, James, he said, do you know a boy by, and he named this boy. James said, yeah, preacher, that was the boy I was going to beat the dog out of. He said, well, he just left my office, James. He came to my office today, and he said, Pastor, I need to know the God of James Brady. He said he just left. He just got saved, James. And I'm asking you, is anybody attracted to your Savior by the change they see in you? Do your kids see in mom and dad at home somebody whose life has been changed by the Savior? Do your neighbors, your fellow workers? Zacchaeus had such a change. I can't prove it in the Bible, but history records that Zacchaeus became a pastor in Caesarea later on. What a change. Maybe some of us this morning need to be saved. If you were to be honest, you know if you stood before the Lord, you, you don't remember a time where you gave your heart to Christ. Maybe there's some of us that have some things in our lives that aren't a right testimony. We need to come to the altar and start off this revival saying, Dear Lord, you know there's things that need to change. I'm not much of a, I'm not much of a testimony. I don't have much appeal to others for the cause of Christ. It would want them, cause them to want to know the Lord Jesus. Things need to change. Some of us ought to come to the altar and say, Dear Lord, a long life's journey, the battles have gotten distracted, priorities have gotten out of whack. I've lost that joy of the Lord, and I need to get back and run this race looking unto Jesus. The salvation of Zacchaeus. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do love you this morning. Thank you for loving us, Lord. We're so unworthy. Lord, sir, grateful. Help us this morning, Lord, to be honest with thee. I don't know anybody's condition of their heart this morning, but you do. So please, I pray, do a work in hearts. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Nobody looking. I want to ask you this morning. And you say, Brother Booth, I could take you to the place. I remember where it was. When the Spirit of God convicted my heart, I, I knew I was deserving of hell. And somebody showed me how to trust Jesus, and with a sincere, repentant heart, I called on the Lord and trusted Him as my Savior. Brother Booth, if I died right now, thank God I know without a doubt that I'd go to heaven. I know I'm saved. If that's your honest testimony, would you indicate that by raising your hand? Just raise it up and put it down. Thank you. Be honest. I'm not going to embarrass anybody, I promise you that. I want you to be honest with the Lord this morning. And I wonder how many would say, yes, I'm saved. I, I, I thank the Lord I'm saved. But man, I needed that reminder this morning. Man, I've lost the joy of the Lord. The struggles and the challenges of life have got my eyes off of my, off of my Lord and on my circumstances. 
And I need to get my eyes back on the Lord. Uh, it's, it's caused me to lose some of the priorities that the Lord wants in my life. Or maybe you'd say the truth is my testimony isn't, isn't that of a change that has taken place from this old world. There's too much of the world that still flavors my life. You'd say, Brother Booth, as a Christian this morning, the Holy Spirit knew I needed that. And he spoke to my heart this morning as a Christian. Pray for me. Would you slip your hands up, Christians? God spoke to your heart this morning. God bless you. Thank God for you. Many hands. Thank God for your tender hearts. You may put them down. Maybe there's somebody else. Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you'd say, Brother Booth, be honest with you. Some things maybe that you didn't even preach, but the Holy Spirit's dealing with me about my Christian life. Some areas that I know he's not pleased with. And I didn't raise my hand as a Christian that God's speaking in my heart, but I'm raising it now. Include me in the prayer. He's dealing with my heart as well. Include me. Just slip your hand up. There are others, several others. Thank you. God bless you. Glad we waited. I want to ask this. I wonder who would be honest with the Lord this morning and say, Brother Booth, if I died right now, I can't tell you I'm 100% sure I'd go to heaven. I sure don't want to die and go to hell. If I could be absolutely sure according to the Bible that I was forgiven, saved, and on my way to heaven, I'd like to have that settled for sure. Please pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? God bless you. God bless you. That's me. I, I, I didn't raise my hand that I was sure because I'm not sure, but I'd like to be sure. I'm not trying to talk you out of something you have. When you get saved, thank God, you're born into the family. You can't be unborn. But I'm talking about if you've never made that decision to sincerely, honestly, put your faith and trust in Christ and Him alone. Not trusting the church to get you to heaven. Not trusting baptism. Trusting Jesus and Him alone. Yeah, that's me. Pray for me. I, I'm not sure. I want to tell you, there is no fulfillment in your life. You'll battle all the way through life. And there will be no fulfillment till you begin to let Jesus Christ rule your life. Have his way in your life. Anybody else, that's me. Pray for me. I, I need to be saved. I just need to get it settled. Pray for me. Say, I, I'm embarrassed. You don't have to be embarrassed in this crowd. You're among people that love you. Rejoice with your decision. It's the best decision you can make. And nobody on their deathbed has ever regretted making that decision. I'm going to ask you to stand with me for prayer. After I pray, Brother Bob will sing, and God spoke to your heart. Let's not hesitate. You raised your hand. I'm going to pray for you. Then I can't do any more than that. Then the choice is up to you. God spoke to your heart as a Christian. Let's find a place at the altar. Start off the revival right. Let God have his way. Give him, speak to him about whatever he's spoken to you about. Get his grace to give you victory. You're not sure you're saved. We don't want you to just come and kneel at the the front and go back to your pew if you're not sure you're saved please come let pastor know at the front i want to be sure that i'm saved i'm not sure i'm saved and he'll have somebody trained in the bible show you from the bible how to get it settled this morning lord please now bless the invitation god do the only work that can be done in hearts and that's by thee please do that work holy spirit draw those that need to be saved give them courage now to come and let pastor know they want to be saved those that have other decisions they need to make as Christians, help them to come and humble themselves at an old-fashioned altar. Give victories, we pray, in Jesus' name. As the music plays, God spoke to your heart. You need to come. You come now, would you? Let's not hesitate. God dealing with you. Come on. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. Others need to come. Let's not hesitate. God deal with your heart. Come on. You're not sure you're saved? Don't leave that way. If you'll come, we can show you from the Bible how to, how to have that settled. It's a joyful reception. You need to come. You come. Don't worry about what anybody else is doing. God's speaking to your heart. You feel that. Wash me just that discomfort, now, that rumbling in your heart, that's the Spirit of God saying you need to get this settled. Come on. God's speaking have to you. Come thine on. Own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and
and weary. Help me, I pray. Power, all oh power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see. Christ only always living in me. Our Father, we bow before you in prayer now. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts today. Thank you, Father, for including the conversion of Zacchaeus and putting it in the Bible. We could glean the truths this morning that were shared with us uh, through your servant today. Thank you for speaking to our hearts and for helping us this morning. Thank you for these decisions that have been made for you. And, Lord, I pray that you'll dismiss us now with your care, that we'll be mindful that you go with us from this place. And I pray, Lord, that others will see what a difference it's made since Jesus passed by in our life and help us to point others to Christ today. And give us a good afternoon, prepare us for what you have for us tonight, and bring us back this evening for tonight's service. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Brother Booth will be at the back door there and uh, shake his hand as you go out this morning. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you back tonight, 630 for the evening service. Let's sing together. Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joins heads with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight. <laughs>